Beauty calls and gives no warning. Shadows rise and wander on the day. In the twilight, in the quiet evening. Anna Friedrich is a poet who lived four years in the Alps and ventured around in Europe with her husband and two sons and moved here a few years ago now. Anna is a writer, a speaker, a cook, and a tutor at Labrie Fellowship, which is near Boston, Massachusetts. Anna and her husband and her two teenage sons now live in a New England mansion with 10 to 20 other people, depending on the day, and they are wrestling with the big questions of meaning, faith, vocation, and goodness of soup. <laughs> we have some folks, perhaps, from Libri here today <laughs> who know about that. Some people might not know that Anna also uh, favors swing dancing, and she enjoys going to thrift stores and has created some pop-up thrift stores. And at one point, she wrote a little jingle about the periodic table that did quite well on YouTube. Her poems have been appeared, have appeared in Crux, The Tishman's Reviews, Art on the Trails, and seven of her butterfly poems, which, as you see, uh, there is evidence of butterfly here, were included in A. Rocha International Art Exhibit titled The Butterfly Project in 2019. At this time, she is here to share some of her own poems with you, and we'll also be able to see these images that she will tell you about. I am delighted to introduce you to Anna Friedrich. Thank you, Cheryl. I am really honored to be here, um, especially in the last season of Wake Up and Smell the Poetry. Um, I'm pretty new to the world of poetry. I've only been giving myself to it quite faithfully for about five or six years. Before that, I was more in the world of music, in the singer-songwriter world. So I love this intersection. I love that this is a place where singer-songwriters, poets, storytellers can come together and share and inspire each other. So thank you, Cheryl, for facilitating such a space and for so long. And Mel, I look forward to your feature as well. For almost three years now, I have been collaborating with a dear friend, an artist, a watercolorist named Heidi. We'll get to see some of her images throughout my reading this morning. She was welcomed by a faith-based environmental education and activism organization. Does that sound like an unlikely organization? I'm sorry that it does. It shouldn't be. And I'm glad to tell you it exists. Um, it's called Arasha. And she was invited to be their artist in residence uh, a few years ago. And she asked me as a fellow artist to come alongside her. Her medium would be watercolors and my medium would be words on the page. So I've been writing poems about butterflies and moths uh, for the last few years. You can ask my poetry workshop friends from the Southborough Library. They'll tell you how many butterfly poems they have heard. Um, so we decided to attempt to pay attention to one small thing, that being butterflies and moths. We wanted to give our attention to this small thing for a period of time and then do our creative work in honor of these small creatures, to celebrate them, to learn from them even, to listen to them. We even raised butterflies throughout this process. And I just want to say how good it has been to give our attention to this one small creature um, in this abundant and wild and beautiful planet. Even to pay attention to one thing is a precious endeavor. So I'm going to read a few poems from The Butterfly Project. This first one is called Imago, and in the world of scientific taxonomy, you're probably familiar with the word larva, 
which is what we call the, the caterpillar stage. The pupa is the chrysalis stage. And the imago is the adult butterfly stage. So this first poem is called Imago. And the main character in this poem is sitting in the room, just so you know. Mm -hmm. It's my son. Imago. On the back porch in late summer, I sit stunned beside my son, Adam. The porch is a hundred years old with new boards freshly painted sky blue. Adam is 11, lanky and curious, crouching next to me like a monkey, mon petit singe, but motionless. Our first caterpillar chrysalis turned black last night, and we are nearly crying. What was a jade green bulb with a golden crown that we protected, propped up, prayed for, shrouded this morning, a lump of coal on a broken branch. Is it dead? he asks. Like a chaplain whisked through a curtain and left in a hospital room, I try to read the moment, searching for signs of death while rehearsing my calling, hope. Let's wait and see, I answer. And that is enough for him to dash into the day unencumbered. A month ago, he dubbed this caterpillar Lucky. And like the first Adam, he has a knack for naming. That was a fitting one to start with, especially because the like a chaplain image um, came to me at an event that Cheryl hosted, actually. I was thinking it was a, a writing event, but it was actually a storytelling evening where Cheryl invited a a hospital chaplain to come and share stories and uh, that's where that image came like a like a chaplain whisked through a curtain um, and in a sense that became an image for the whole project what we have called the butterfly project uh, which for Heidi and I the painter and I culminated in an exhibit where her paintings were on exhibit my poems were on exhibit I gave a reading and then we also had an educational element to help people know more about the state of our planet and how they might um, yeah, how they might protect and steward this place well. Um, and so that image of like a chaplain, it has stayed with me because in some ways, looking at our pollinators has meant a long <coughs> meditation on death, to be honest. Um, standing by watching things die. And it's quite historical to relate to butterflies and moths that way. The more I studied them, I realized cultures throughout history have looked to the butterfly as this metaphor for life and death and life after death. So this next poem reflects that. It is called Every Night a Funeral. Every night a funeral rehearsal in my bed. I lie, again, after a mere day given to reclaim conscious thought, voice, loves, then the awful necessity of sleep takes hold. But this caterpillar seems ecstatic in her flailing final molt. She hangs head first, she dives into the grave, chrysalis dark, as if somehow she heard Jesus say, why are you weeping? She is only asleep. Yes, a long meditation on death, <laughs> but also hope. When I have looked at butterflies and their surprising, even unnecessary beauty and variety, um, not to anthropomorphize them too much, but when you pay attention to them, it looks like they're incredibly patient creatures, 
persevering creatures, even tenacious. And they speak what I imagine to be a kind of yes out into the world through their radical transformation. This next poem is called The Wild Yes. Her grave clothes tear and seem to shrink into paper so thin I reach out to catch her, but she clings like Ruth to Naomi. Her strength is young but sure. I hold instead my breath, antenna flicking. If she could blink, she would be blinking her old dusty frame now like a freshened leaf in spring. If you are so lucky as to see her first full extension, the flutter in your own belly will match the wild yes that the butterfly knows. You'll notice that I often refer to the caterpillars and butterflies as she's. I can't say that I knew the gender of the caterpillars and butterflies that I was raising or that I've witnessed in butterfly houses and in the wild and in exhibits. Um, but I've just landed there because I am a she, so there's some resonance. And if we're honest, there have been a lot of he's in the history of poetry. So we're going to make room for some she's. <laughs> this is my last butterfly poem um, for this morning. And it may be obvious at this point, but my faith informs and inspires and guides my poetry in a lot of ways. This next poem is called Holy Saturday. And... In the Christian tradition, Holy Saturday is the day in between Good Friday and Easter Sunday. And it's a day of grief. It's a day of confusion, a day of silence, a day of doubt. And that's the kind of space this poem requires. And throughout the project, I'm not sure I've done this well, but I have wanted to avoid reducing the butterfly just to a metaphor. You know, so to pay attention to butterflies and moths and then just turn them into, I'm really talking about humans and our concerns and our worries. I haven't wanted to do that. But in my passion not to do that, I realized I also needed to let the butterfly speak metaphorically um, to me and to my own heart even to the most tender places in my heart and in my story. So this poem is called Holy Saturday. I apologize for the metaphor, dear caterpillar. I've read you like a Bible verse that caught my eye on a city bench far from home. The wily human heart, you see, longs for something purer than luck or chance. Freedom to hope, I guess. And how you grovel on what they call, I kid you not, false legs. And how you eat and eat way beyond appetite. It's all too familiar, caterpillar. How you one day turn in, get awfully quiet, wound up and bound to a secrecy. I know that feeling. No fresh air, no sunlight. You must question the royal title, monarch, at this point. I do. That is why you bring to mind expectant pharaohs mummified and Jesus in Joseph's tomb, still wrapped in strips of linen, and my own baby swaddled, buried in a shoebox under the purple butterfly bush in bloom.
The next two are still in the vein of um, environmental concerns. They're both responses to art installations uh, that were part of an event in, our, in my town in Southboro. It's called Art on the Trails. I've been a part of it for the last couple of years. I'm so glad Catherine Weber is here. Um, it's been a wonderful thing to be a part of. I would highly encourage you to see if your own town does something like that or start something like it in your town. But local artists could make, um, could submit installations of all sorts to be seasonally set up along walking trails. And then poets were invited to write in response to these installations. So the next two were a part of that. This first one I wrote in response to what looked to me like giant teardrops. I think it was maybe even called teardrops. Giant teardrops carved into a tree that had fallen down in the woods. Or we might call it a giant's teardrops. On meeting sorrow in the woods. She said, tears can score a tree. I couldn't possibly agree, I said. Think of the years of rings and weathering, how storms have pummeled trees with rain, yet they remain. She said her tears were from her God, the God of grief who ever cries without relief. I know gods don't cry like that, I said, and sat beside her on the path where she greeted fireflies. There were seashells in her hair. She lifted leaf litter like a child in her arms. She said her tears always start, not in her heart, but in her toes. I looked down then. Her feet were bare, but caked with mud. She said her tears were bigger than any I'd seen before. On my own cheeks, I asked, the ones that splashed my infant's grave. She turned away to catch her breath, I guess. When she returned, she gave me a tear from her own eye. Boulder sized, I could not hold it, not with ropes or measuring cups. Its will and weight fell and washed me clean. After the storm, I searched for her to tell her I believe. This one I also wrote in response to an installation in the most recent Art on the Trails. One artist just kind of plunked a bed down a human queen-size bed in the middle of the forest with a mattress, comforter, night tables, lamps, a chandelier, and all, right there in the middle of the woods. It was pretty, pretty compelling. And um, as I looked at it, I walk these trails a lot. They're very near our home. As I kept passing by this, I had this very motherly phrase in my mind, well, you've made your bed, and so, that's right, you gotta lie in it. <laughs> and it became this image that I actually thought could hold my frustrations at our current environmental moment, my fears, even my own responsibility, that this bed imagery could hold a great deal. So I wrote this prayer poem um, in response to that. It's called Shriven. Lord, we have made our bed here in the dust, right where you placed us. Among trees, we are fellow creatures marking days as if time is our territory, as if this canopy is of our making. Lord, remember us embedded under cloud cover Will it gather to a greatness as if to smother? Mother us, Lord, 
Tucked in like chicks, sheltered by your greater wings, we huddle in the dust, right where you placed us, but do not rest. The lullaby we long for in the darkness goes unsung. Now it is the owl's turn, coyotes dirge, the trees of the field all cry out in numbers reported by the UN. Lord, who can count our losses? Who will win the wrestling match we're in? Gone to the mattresses. Gone are the days when self-restraint was esteemed, nearly extinct. We have made our bed here, Lord. Help us not to lie. The next one is a little more lighthearted. <laughs> um, this past fall, I had a lot of transmission problems <laughs> in several cars. And uh, it's funny, given all of these, these poems I've just read, my husband and I have been in a conversation, I won't call it an argument, about trying to live with one car. Um, just as a way of reducing our carbon footprint. And, well, that happened. We are now living with one car. We didn't exactly make the, the choice. It was made for us in many ways. But I'm sure many of you can relate to this. In the midst of very frustrating circumstances, a transmission went, the next transmission went, we bought a car, it had transmission problems within four days. Um, in the midst of that, I wanted to find something hidden in the struggle, you know, some gem, something good that I could make some art with <laughs> in all the transmission problems. Um, and so I wrote this poem as a, an attempt of that. It's so new that it does not yet have a title. And it is one big question. If there's not a poem here in the lifted transmission of my Nissan Versa, while Amin and his brothers all huddle underneath, with one single flashlight together they ask, why won't the power transmit to the wheels? Why can't this energy created, sustained, become movement and force and a sure ride to who knows where. If there are no poems in the mechanic's blackened hands, in an engine's broken groan, in the stuttered confession of a tow truck driver, then where the hell are they? <laughs> You. This is my last poem. It is, as I said, the last one was basically one big question. I love questions in poems. One of my favorite poets, Denise Levertov, um, uses questions brilliantly throughout her work, especially her poem, Flickering Mind, ends in one of the most haunting questions I've yet to read in a poem. And I think a question is a hospitable thing to do in a poem. It invites others to, to join in, to consider, to respond. And I try to utilize questions uh, as best I can in my own poems. So this one in many ways culminates in a question too. I have to give credit um, to two poets. Uh, first of all, Gerard Manley Hopkins, who was a, a 19th century poet and Jesuit priest and professor, he, one of his untitled sonnets begins, um, I wake and feel the fell of dark, not day. And that poem, that whole sonnet is kind of in the background of this poem of mine. And I also need to give credit to Christian Wyman, who is a living poet, um, a wonderful poet whose 
especially his poem, Every Riven Thing. I believe he made a new form in this poem. It's a new form that I wanted to emulate. I wanted to work with and try my hand at. He takes one line and repeats it throughout the poem. That's not so new, hey? But he takes this line and breaks it at different points throughout. And only at the end of the poem do you get the whole line no longer riven, essentially. You get to hear it whole. And I wanted to do something like that, but I was having a hard time. And finally I realized, okay, his subject matter led itself, you know, lended itself to that. I, I'm going to try and flip it and start with the whole line and then break it up throughout the poem and see how that goes. So the idea of this form, straight from Christian Wyman. And the title, Ways You Went, is a phrase from that Hopkins poem I, I mentioned. So, Ways You Went, After Hopkins, After Wyman. I wake up in a crowded room. Dreams that worked my jaw all night press in, then dissipate. Alone, I turn to see my husband is already up. The kettle proves he knows I love hot coffee when I wake. Up in a crowded room in heaven, that cloud of witnesses turns to see me rise into a new day. Bra, skirt, sweater, shoes, keys, guilt that pokes and nags and wonders why I wake up. In the crowded room behind my eyes, spreadsheets spread while I drive demanding, total the lattes this year. Add the cost of the sweater against the hunger and injustice in my wake. Up in a crowded room in the city, elected men address their lists and calendars. Power calls to power, maneuvering in the graceless dark that you and I wake up in. A crowded room is no place to ask where is God? But go ahead. Oh, we have awakened sweet and had our birth, and that's the end of earth. And we have toiled and smiled and kept the light, and that's the end of night. 